Okay, so Lauren, thank you very much for agreeing to give a Build a Cell seminar and it's all yours. Okay, great. Right, okay, uh, yeah, you guys, my name is Lauren Williams. I've met many of you. Um, and uh, I've also invited my uh, graduate level macromolecular structure class to be here. So they are, they are here in the meeting. Um, unfortunately, this is all electronic, so they, you guys won't get to meet each other, but it's a very, very good class. And uh, they are all experts at um, molecular structure and actually they even know quite a bit about the ribosome. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about the ribosome today and um, it's relevant to build a cell, of course, because if you wanna build a cell, you have to have a translation system and uh, it's one of the core functionalities in the cell. And I'm, not, I'm just gonna sort of introduce you to the way we think about the ribosome and the origins and evolution of the ribosome. And I will say George Fox is here on the meeting and uh, he could probably give this seminar better than me. Um, because George, George is one of the world's experts, of course, on the ribosome. Um, and he's also my close collaborator. So um, yeah, I, I, we study this, you know, I, uh, we have a center, a NASA funded center. In fact, Kate and Aaron are members of that center. So is George. And um, then this is my research group. Um, pretty much everybody here at some level studies the ribosome uh, in the very, oh wait, I need to fix my, okay. How do I, does anybody, can you guys, does anybody know how I make my cursor work better? Um, how do I get? You want, you want a laser pointer? Yeah, exactly. Oh wait. Right click. Pointer option. Yeah. And I go to yep. laser pointer. Yep. Thank Perfect. you. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is Anton Petrov. Um, who is a research scientist um, with me, and and uh, he is, um, you know, he's one of the world's. He has a three-dimensional structure of the ribosome memorized down to the positions of all the atoms, and he's just this kind of incredible guy. Who um, a lot of the work I'm going to talk about really um, would, would not have happened without Anton. Um, and then I have this my close collaborator Roger Wartell is back here. Um, I've been working with Roger for a long time. And then my lab manager, Jessica, she's a research scientist. She's been with me for a long time. So those are the main people I guess I should credit here. The, I have a really good research group who's doing a lot of things. Okay, so I wanna just introduce you a little bit to the ribosome and um, some sort of important features of it. Uh, firstly, there is a large subunit and a small subunit. And here, the large subunit is on the right and the small subunit is on the left. And we are representing the three-dimensional structure and something called the secondary structure. Um, so, and what we have here is we have a, a bacterial ribosome, which is E. coli. We have a pyrococcus ribosome, which is an archaean, and we have a yeast ribosome, which is a eukaryote. So we're sort of representing here ribosomes from across the tree of life. And uh, first thing I want you to appreciate is that the ribosome is very large. And this is just the ribosomal RNA we're looking at here. The small subunit ribosomal RNA is about 1600 nucleotides in bacteria. And the large subunit is around 3000 nucleotides. Um, and one of the things I want you to notice here, I hope you can, is that the bacterial ribosomal RNA is a bit smaller than archaeal ribosomal RNA. So let's, let's just focus on right there. This is called helix 25. And, uh, and the, the blue part is the, is the part that's universal to everything. And the black part is the part that changes. So uh, just look at helix 25 right there and you can see how big it is in bacteria. And then you go down here to an archaean and it's larger. And then you go down to the eukaryote and it's even larger. So uh, bacterial ribosomes appear to be the simplest and uh, kind of bit, maybe you could say the most streamlined, they're the smallest. Although the difference between bacteria and archaea is not enormous. The difference between you know, eukarya really stands out as having uh, very large and complex ribosomes, but um, uh, our 
archaea is kind of intermediate in that scale and bacteria is at the lower limit. Okay, so this is the ribosomal RNA. And then if you look at the proteins, um, this is kind of how we think about the proteins. The black at the bottom here, by the way, if anybody has a question or anything, just don't hesitate to interrupt me. The black are the universal proteins that all ribosomes have those same, those same proteins. So here, the, color, the red part of the SSU is the part of the ribosome that, of the ribosomal RNA that's universal. And the blue is the part of the ribosomal, large subunit ribosomal RNA that's universal. And you can see there's a lot of it. And then if you look at ribosomal proteins, you can see there's a large a number of ribosomal proteins that are universal. That means everything alive has them. And if you look, the, the way the nomenclature works here, this is UL1. That means universal large subunit number one. <laughs> and the, the numbers are based on mobility on gels, which is not really, so this is the, this is the slowest moving ribosomal protein on a gel. That's, what, that's why it's number one. It's not very informative. Um, uh, so that's universal large number one. And then over here on the other side of this, you have US10. This is a you know, universal small subunit ribosomal protein. So everything has those. And then you could see up here on the top right in the blue, there are some bacteria specific uh, large subunit proteins, and there are some bacteria specific small subunit proteins. And I, I think the bacteria, a bacterium has around 50 total ribosomal proteins. Um, and then when you look at archaea, you know, they have all the universal, of course, and then they have more. You can see that there are more proteins in an archaeal ribosome than in a bacterial ribosome. And then when you go out to eukarya, all of the archaea, every single uh, archaean uh, ribosomal protein is found in the eukaryotic ribosome. And then there are more, okay? So this also shows you that the, the eukaryotic ribosome is just bigger and more complex. And also that the archaeal ribosome is slightly more complex than the bacterial. There's more ribosomal proteins. Okay, so that's sort of a general introduction. So when we, when we think about the tree of life, uh, the first thing to think about when you have a universal tree of life is that this is the lineage of the ribosome. And uh, you know the ribosome we say was completed at LUCA and then everything inherited its ribosome in a linear fashion, mean, meaning not through universal, not, not, not through horizontal gene transfer, but in, you know, in a, in a vertical uh, inheritance process from their ancestor and to form the tree of life. And so what, you know, what this tree of life, this is Jill Banfield's tree, which came out a couple of years ago um, and got a lot of press, partly because it's really beautiful, but also because it's very informative and she has a bunch of new things that have not been seen before. Um, but what you can see on this tree of life is that all of the top part, that's bacteria. So most things alive are bacteria. And uh, then this branch coming out at the bottom is archaea. And you can see us, eukaryotes, we are a branch of, our, of archaea. And I'll just say that, you know, really what this is, is you take the universal ribosomal proteins, which I showed you before, there's about 30 of them, and you concatenate them, and then you make a distance tree. And that's what this is. This is a distance tree of, of concatenated universal ribosomal proteins. And um, this is how we think about the universal tree of life. And one of the interesting things, of course, George Fox and Carl Wilson, when they made their first tree of life where they discovered archaea, they didn't use ribosomal proteins. They used the ribosomal RNA. And even now, if you use the ribosomal RNA, the tree is not exactly the same as if you use the ribosomal proteins. This is something that pains us that we don't really understand fully why the tree of life looks different when you look at the ribosomal RNA. A little bit different. I mean, I'm not saying it's fundamentally different, but there are some important differences like the, the, the location of eukarya um, shifts a bit when you, uh, when you use ribosomal RNA. This is something we don't really understand and something we're trying to understand. Um, another important thing about here is that everything comes back to LUCA. So, this tree stops at LUCA. It does not look beyond LUCA. And it really, this kind of tree can't. I mean, uh, it can't go beyond 
uh, the last universal common ancestor. And so what this is showing you is uh, basically the evolution of life on Earth over the last, I don't know, 3.8 billion years. We don't really know when Luca was, but it was something like 3.8 billion years ago. So this is, with this kind of tree, we really cannot look beyond that. And I want to make this really clear that this is based on sequences, sequences of ribosomal proteins. That's where this tree comes from. And usually when people make a tree of life, that's, or any kind of phylogenetic tree, it doesn't matter. It's based on sequences and distances uh, between, um, distances between uh, sequences. So this is just really, uh, the tree of life is just math and sequence. That's all you're doing. This thing just crunches out immediately. Okay, now I wanna switch and look at structure, okay? Um, because in our lab we've developed, we, you know, our goal is to look beyond LUCA and to, to basically say, where did the ribosome come from? The ribosome was mature at LUCA. And uh, if we're talking about the origins and evolution of the ribosome, we need to look beyond LUCA and the sequences you really cannot, you cannot do that. So uh, we need to use some other methods. And uh, starting some time ago, maybe 10 years at least, we started looking at ribosomal structure. And the reason it's kind of natural because it's been known for a long time that structure is more conserved than sequence. And if you wanna look far back in time, structure has information that sequence doesn't have. So you can have, this is true for protein or RNA, that you can have structure, you can have proteins or macromolecules, let's say with conserved structure, and there's essentially no sequence homology. It's all been washed out by evolution, and yet the structure is conserved. So structure is more conserved than sequence, and if you want to look far back in time, structure works better. So let's start, this is, this is part of the ribosome. In fact, this is the uh, peptidyl transfer, part of the peptidyl transferase center, so in the core of the large subunit. And I'm not showing you sequence here, right? I'm showing you a backbone trace of the RNA. And uh, this is from bacteria. You can see up at the right, this is from E. coli. And we know this, this is from three-dimensional structures uh, that are determined by X-ray diffraction. So it's, this is not made up. This is real data, you could say. And this is what the E. coli uh, ribosome looks like in the peptidyl transferase center. So that if we then go over to the next branch of the tree of life, which is an archaeal structure, this shows you how much change there has been since LUCA in the three-dimensional structure, right? These, the, the way to think about this is, you know, you have LUCA and uh, there's been about 4 billion years of evolution. Uh, and this is how much change happened in the ribosome. Uh, so really this is 8 billion years, right? Because it's 3 billion years in each, or it's 4 billion years in each branch. So this is, this is what 8 billion years of evolution of the ribosome does to you, does for you in terms of structure. Not very much. And if you just add, uh, one of the things we know if, if, if archaea and bacteria are the same, then archaea is really just, sorry, eukarya is just a branch of archaea. And you can see, of course, uh, eukarya has to be, um, Okay, so I put two on here. Uh, one is the yeast and the other is the mitochondrial from human. So this shows you like all over the tree of life, wherever you go, how much divergence you get in the core of the ribosome. So the good thing is that if you're interested in using structure to go back in time, this tells you that there is a record, right? This is basically the ribosome at LUCA. We know what it was and we know it hasn't changed since LUCA. So that means um, we can use the rib extant ribosomal structures still maintain a record of the LUCA ribosome. So we can use them to go back in time. That's what this is telling us. If these were all divergent and they were all different, then we wouldn't have the information to go back beyond LUCA. But the fact that they're all the same tells us that the ribosome has not changed since LUCA and that we can use the ribosome to go back before LUCA. There's essentially nothing else in biology that you can do this with. There's nothing that shows this extent of conservation. This is the reason why we're so focused on the ribosome is because it has the best deep, deep, deep historical record in biology. Okay, so um, what, 
what this is, is um, a mapping of the universal part of the ribosome. It's kind of what I showed you before. So on the right, we have the large subunit and um, the blue parts are part are universal. We call those them, the, we call the blue part the common core. That means every ribosome has that. Your ribosomes have it. The bacteria that live in your gut have it. Everything alive has uh, that blue part. And um, the, then on the red is the same for the small subunit. And the gray parts are the parts that are divergent between species. So one thing you can see, okay, and so this is mapped onto the bacterial ribosome. And so one thing you can say is that the bacterial ribosome, essentially the RNA essentially exists in everything alive. Um, or you could call it, we could call it the prokaryote, you know, uh, archaean RNA looks kind of the same. So we could say that all eukaryotes have prokaryotic ribosomal RNA inside them. So you're at, at the core, your ribosomes are not different from your very, very distant ancestors. That's what this is saying. But I wanna focus on the other parts, the gray, the black parts, the parts that are divergent. So I, I showed you helix uh, 25 here in bacteria. And then here is the same thing in eukarya, sorry, in archaea. And then you can see it grows into this large thing here down in yeast. And what one of the things we like to do is we try to understand the origins, the evolution of the ribosome, and it's very difficult to understand it if everything is conserved. So initially we focus on the divergent parts and say, what are the rules of ribosomal evolution? And, and using this divergence and then walking back at time, we've been able to come up with a very, very detailed uh, history of the ribosome. And um, these are a couple. So Anton Petrov, who I talked to you about, is, um, uh, is was very important to this effort. See, George Fox is works with us on this, um, and uh, and we have a series of papers in which we have worked out the origin of the ribosome going back before Luca. And uh, it's actually a very detailed model, and it's it's structure based. And I want to just explain to you a little bit about how we did that. We had to kind of invent the methods to do it because you can't use sequence. We can't use se normal sort of phylogenetic reconstruction because you know essentially LUCA is a, you could say LUCA is an event horizon. If you're using sequence, you cannot really productively go beyond LUCA except under very specific circumstances. So what we did was we focused on we first focused on the parts of the ribosome that are divergent over biology. And what I wanna show you here is a little bit of an indication of how that works. So what we have here is the size of the human ribosome over history. And we have reconstruction methods, which I'm not really gonna to explain to you. <laughs> you can ask me, but it's, there's, a, there's a, several different methods you can use to do uh, reconstructions if you have a, a lot of sequences and things. So this is looking over pretty recent history. We call recent history, you know, the last uh, 3 billion years. So for us, dinosaurs are like yesterday and, you know, we're thinking about very long history. And this is the size of the, the, the human ribosome and its ancestors. And so, you know, we know that our ultimate ancestor was Luca and we know that Luca diverged into archaea and that there we have an archaean ancestor and that we know the we know the size of the archaean ribosome and then we we have a good we have a pretty good uh, date and time and I sort of an identification of the characteristics of the earliest eukaryotes and then we could just progress through our uh, ancestors, and so the, what I'm I, what I'm trying to show you here is that even though the ribosome is highly conserved, it also changes rapidly. And in fact, we are in log phase as far as the growth of the ribosome right now. The ribosome is changing faster now than at any time in its history, except maybe right after the origin of life. We really don't know when. We don't know really when the ribosome initiated and when LUCA was, but there wasn't very much time there. That was all pretty quick. So there was a lot of things happened quickly. Then there was a long period of stasis 
This is called the boring billions. This is when the uh, earth was microbial and the ribosome really didn't do very much. We know in microbes, it just doesn't. And then with the rise in eukarya and then animals and all sorts of mammals, things have gone crazy. So we can predict in a billion years, the ribosome of our descendants, assuming we have some, is going to be extremely large. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not, I guess I could write that in cement and blast it into outer space and then somebody could test that prediction. Um, okay, so what, what I wanna do is focus on the, the divergence in the ribosome. What we did is we studied the divergence in the ribosome where it changes and we learned how the ribosome changes. And then we use that to understand the oldest part of the ribosome. And I, uh, let me think about, it. yes. Okay, so I wanna just show you this Helix 25. I wanna keep going back to that because that was very useful to us. So this is in E. coli, Helix 25. And this is in one archaean. This is uh, Pyrococcus, and then here's Loki, another Archaean. Before I think I showed you maybe Halo Archula. I don't know. We look at various um, uh, Archaea. And then uh, it's, and one thing we can say is that the ribosome is slightly larger in Archaea, and that the, the divergence from bacteria in Archaea predicts the really large divergences in, we see in. Um, eukarya. So what we can say about archaea is that, so for example, you know, helix 25 is small in bacteria. It gets a little bigger in archaea and we can say, okay, that's a hot spot. That's where it's going to explode in eukarya. And it does. You can pretty much go through the, use that logic um, in that archaean ribosomes predict to a large extent what's going to happen in, um, in, in eukaryotic ribosomes. Here's, I'll just show you another place. This is a thing, there's a little helix here. I don't remember the number, number of that helix, but then that expands into something we call expansion segment 39 in, uh, in an archaea. And then it gets, actually in Loki, it gets really big. And then that's a place, that one in uh, eukaryotes just goes kind of crazy. So archaean ribosomes predict the behaviors of eukaryotic ribosomes. That's something, um, we have seen. So I want to focus right now on eukaryotic ribosomes. If you look here on the right, we have yeast, we have fruit fly, and we have us. And you can see there's a lot of divergence in, actually, this is called expansion segment seven. Um, it starts with helix 25. It's this little bitty thing over here in E. coli. It's really not very interesting in E. coli, but in eukaryotes, it starts to really go crazy. And then in, in um, in mammal, mammals and birds, it forms what are called tentacles that reach out and we're not really sure what they're doing, but they form these tentacles um, in mammals and birds. But what this gives us is a lot of divergence in the ribosome and it allows us to study the evolution of the ribosome. So this is, this is helix, sorry, this is ES7 over the eukaryotic phylogenetic tree. And a couple of things to notice is that in parasites, it gets really small. You know, parasites, there's this kind of minimization of genomes and of ribosomes, and it has kind of reverted back to its, uh, um, you know, prokaryotic state um, in parasites. So parasites are a special class that have to be thought about in separately because uh, the ancestors of these parasites were large, is, is what we think, and then they, you know, in the, in the sort of, uh, obligate parasitic environment, their genomes get reduced and their ribosomes do likewise. So that's a, those are a separate class. But if you look at, okay, we have a bunch of fungi here on the right and they're kind of the same in fungi. Uh, and then you look and you, you get into animals, right? We have C. elegans, it starts to grow and look at fish, it's getting bigger. And uh, then look at chicken. Uh, chicken, we start to see, we see a tentacle in chickens. And um, mouse, the, we, it has a tentacle, but it's in a different place. Uh, chimpanzees has a couple of tentacles, and then humans has to have tentacles, but longer. I believe the chicken has the longest tentacle, um, but humans has, has maybe the most, as far as we know, has the most tentacle RNA because 
on average, the tentacles are larger. But what this gives us is a large database of divergence of the ribosome, and we can use this to study how the ribosome changes over time. That's really what we want to know is, can we figure out how the ribosome evolves? And uh, the nice thing about this, these are secondary structures, but we have three-dimensional structures. You know, we have this idea that we can understand the ribosome by looking how it changes in three-dimensional structure. So I want to start and just look at that expansion segment seven, which starts as helix 25 in a bacteria, sorry, in LUCA. This is what we think it looked like in LUCA. And then, and these are experimental three-dimensional structures. These are not models or things like that. These are either from X-ray diffraction or from cryo -EM. So if you start with what we think is LUCA and you look at archaea, the sort of next level of complexity, what you see here is that the original helix 25 is conserved in structure and something has grown out of it um, when it gets bigger. Okay, so we're just basically kind of putting these in order of size um, and uh, asking how, how does the ribosome grow? Okay, so what we see here is that the basal structure, which is helix 45 is maintained and something grew out. Okay, so then here's the archaeal ribosome and here's another larger one. This is the yeast ribosome. And we're just focused on uh, 25, which is expansion segment seven. And you can see the same thing, which is that the archaeal ribosome is, is essentially there, or the, this part of it, and that things have been added on in yeast. So we see this same pattern where uh, when the ribosome gains mass, it doesn't remodel, okay? It just leaves what's there there and it adds on. And so this is the yeast ribosome. This is the fruit fly ribosome. And look at, so this is helix 25, okay? No matter what, helix 25 never goes away, right? Things, whatever gets added on, gets added on. And, um, and, the, and there's no remodeling of the basal structure. So that's fruit fly, and I think we have one more, which is, of course, human. So look at the same thing. You can basically see the fruit fly, that humans have essentially a fruit, a fruit fly expansion segment seven, but with additional things added on. So this is nice for us, because what it means is that when the ribosome changes, it does not remodel. This was an important thing we discovered. I remember really sitting at a graphics terminal with Anton and a couple of students, and we had we finally had the structures of all these ribosomes, and we superimposed those, and we were like, "Oh my God, you guys! It's just accreting. It's not remodeling. This means we can, if the ribosome accretes, we can understand it. If it remodels every time, then there's nothing we can do." So we were very excited. This was I don't know when this was. This was probably 2014 or something. We're sitting in a, we had a big graphics room and I really distinctly remember when we saw this. It was really exciting to us because what it means is this. It's like a tree. This tree, you don't have to watch the tree grow. This tree grows by accretion and things that grow by accretion retain their history. So you can look at this tree and you can say, I know what the new parts are and the old parts and I can see how it grew. Right? I, can, I know which branch came out of which branch. You don't have to watch it grow. As long as it's growing by accretion and it's not remodeling and you understand the basics of how a tree grows, you can work out the chronology of, of the, this tree. And you know, you know the oldest part of this tree is like right down at the center of that core. And the, yeah, just because you know how trees grow, uh, the chronology of the growth of this tree is obvious to you. And basically that's how the ribosome became to us when we realized this accretion process. And I'm not, you know, we have a bunch of papers on this, which I'm listing here. So I'm not gonna really go into the details, but hopefully you can just understand. I mean, if you think about uh, plants that die out and remodel every year before they grow back, you know, you can't really understand their history, but something like this tree, it, is, it has maintained a record of droughts and of trauma and fire and all the things that, or many of the things that happen to this tree, you can, you can figure them out. The tree has recorded them. And the ribosome is just like that only 4 billion years ago. So this explains a little bit how we do that. But I think I'm gonna, 
you know, this is published and I'm just gonna jump ahead and say what, what we saw. Okay, this is, the, this is the result then. Once we figured out how the ribosome grew, so we, we studied the kind of recent ribosomes, the eukaryotic ribosomes, we figured out how the ribosome grew. Then we looked back to the universal common core and we applied what we learned to that. So now we're looking beyond LUCA. We're looking deep into the core of the ancient ribosome. And what we could identify was these growth events. And so what we've done here is we've cut, every time there's a color change, that's where something gets inserted. So but just looking at the large subunit here, you see that's the number one right there. And I'm not explaining to you exactly how we did this, but that number one, that is the oldest RNA we believe in the universe. That, this is what I call your mother, right? This is, the, this is the beginning of the ribosome, that number one. And then this number two here grew out of that, and then number three and four and five. And we have a very, very detailed history of the ribosome. In fact, it's so detailed, we didn't really know what to do with it. We can see 56 growth events in the large subunit. And I can't remember how 25 or so, no 27, I don't know, 27 in the small subunit. So we have a very detailed and fine grained record of the evolution of the ribosome. And it's based on three dimensional structure. And it's not really biased. We don't really care. We didn't, when we did this, we just said, it's kind of like when you look at a tree, you know, and you cut, into the tree and you can say, okay, this is the oldest, this first ring here, this is the beginning of the tree. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't try to bias this in any way. We just came up with this very detailed uh, building up of the ribosome. And it was so comp, there were so many steps that we just um, couldn't deal with it. So we just grouped them kind of arbitrarily. I mean, no, not arbitrarily, but the seams between the groups, I guess were a bit arbitrary. So, um, and those we call phases. So instead of having 56 growth events, we have six phases and we just kind of group things together. And so that's what this bottom thing is. This is our kind of coarse grain way of looking at what's on top. So again, this dark blue is, that's the beginning, okay? That's the oldest part. Then the phase two is this light blue. And so we've basically, taken these next five things and group them and put them there and sort of walked through like that. So this shows you the kind of uh, evolution of the ribosome. You know, way before we did this, George Fox had done a, a, a related thing where he looked at networking and the ribosome and he identified uh, things that were old and new. And uh, what he saw is, is totally consistent. I, I, I think uh, hopefully George won't be offended to say that our model is way more detailed than his, but he saw, for example, that the interface between the subunits, which is kind of, I think it's the green part right here, is really not the oldest part, right? So uh, George, a long time ago said the large subunit and the small subunit had independent lives and then when the interface was acquired, they met each other and started talking. So that our model saw the same thing. Um, and there were some other models out there that um, were essentially consistent. We didn't do this in a total vacuum. Um, so right now we are looking into this three-dimensional structure of the uh, large subunit. We're looking kind of into the peptidyl transferase center and the interface, so this green, here, this is the sort of what's called the interface between the subunits. That's the large subunit, and that's this green thing here. Um, and that one of the things to say is that that is really important is that the, the interface is not the oldest part of the ribosome. What that means is that the large subunit and the ribos and the small subunit were doing something, and then they met up kind of late. And uh, and the way what George you know, his interpretation of that, which we think is, of course, correct, is that the large subunit was originally, okay, let me also tell you this, I guess I didn't tell you this, is the small subunit does coding, and the large subunit does the chemistry, it makes the bond. So if you have a large subunit with no small subunit, you can't do coding, right? So uh, George has a really nice review in 2004 that for a while, was my Bible when I was first getting into this, which um, I think it's 2004, in which he said, you know, the original large subunit was a non-specific kind of condensing. It just it made uncoded uh, products, 
that it was somehow facilitating synthesis of peptides. Now we think maybe even esters, things like this, but without, without a coding functionality. And then coding kind of came later. So the ribosome, what this tells you though is how old the ribosome is. The ribosome is, the core of the ribosome is older than coded protein. So the ribosome, the core of the ribosome is older than biology as we know it. That's one of the sort of things I find really exciting is that this is very, very old. This is, this goes, this is a, a molecular relic of things that are older than we can imagine because we don't really have good understanding of sort of pre-biology chemical evolution, which is where this comes from. So that's, that's one of the things I find really exciting about the ribosome and why I'm obsessed by it is because I feel like we, if we can figure out, if we can figure it out, we can understand um, really important issues about the origins of life and the nature of biology. Okay, so now I just, I'm not going to tell you exactly how, but I want to go back. This is Jill Banfield's Tree of Life. It's exactly the same as the one I showed you, except I have uh, geometrically kind of abused it, and I put everything on this arc. And what I so this is the bacterial branch, and like in Jill's, it's it dominates, right? Most things alive are bacteria. Diversity in genomes and everything. It's bacteria, right? So that's. That's the same as her. And then uh, archaea is here and eukarya is a branch off of archaea. So this is, this is exactly Jill's tree, except I have changed it around because I'm in, I wanna lay it out so I can show you what the, I wanna look before. Now, we, she, she didn't care about things happened before Luca. She didn't have any information, but we do. So I wanted to lay this out so that I can show you what the ribosome says to us about the evolution before Luca. So, Okay, so th this is things before Luca right here, and I have blown it up here. So this is Luca, and now I just want to tell you what we see in the ribosome. And I haven't really justified this, but um, I'm just going to kind of outline it. We can see, number one, we had what we call uh, pre-ribosomes, which is the pre-LSU and the pre-SSU. And by that, I mean before coding. So that in the extant ribosome, the LSU and the SSU are, they, they don't function separately. They only work together, but um, we have something we call the pre-LSU pre and the pre-SSU, and that's before the interface, okay? Um, and we can see a, a couple things. Number one, that the evolution of the tunnel starts before the acquisition of the interface. So, that's why this tunnel dash line comes before the green. The green is the acquisition of the interface. Once the interface is there, the two subunits come together and we can see, so this is, this straight line is basically the ribosome in the sense that both subunits are working together. And then this thing is the two, uh, the two uh, subunits. And one thing we can see, this is really important, I'm gonna come back to this, is that the, the tunnel is older than the interface, the beginnings of the tunnel. And actually, George and Ada, I keep going back to George, but um, George and Ada Yonth have a paper on uh, the origins of the tunnel, which also outlines this. So that's one thing we can see. We know that how the tunnel evolved. We know how the interface evolved. And this is something I haven't really shown you, but we can also see the evolution of protein folding. That is also frozen within the ribosome. And we can see actually, and this isn't even right anymore. We, Protein folding started with IDRs, intrinsically disordered RNA, uh, protein. That's the first thing that the ribosome did. Then there was beta secondary structure. Then there was beta domains and then complex fold, meaning alpha helices came late. So there was a progression in protein folding that is mapped into the ribosome. I'll show you in a little bit. We can see that the evolution of protein folding has been retained as a molecular record in the ribosome. So just to be clear, it starts as intrinsically disordered, meaning it's frozen in the ribosome, but without secondary structure. Then next step, you get anti-parallel beta hairpins. Shouldn't be beta secondary structure. They're all anti-parallel and pretty much beta hairpins. Then you have simple beta domains like OB folds and things like this, very simple beta domain proteins. Then you get complex folds and those 
um, come with alpha helices. So all of this is mapped in the ribosome. Um, and I will, okay, I have to hurry now because I'm now behind. Okay, so I do, I, I'm gonna quickly just go through the tunnel. You know, the tunnel is this incredible thing in the ribosome that all polypeptide in biology passes through this tunnel, okay? Every polypeptide ever made in the history of the planet Earth has passed through this tunnel. And nature put a lot of time and energy and effort into evolving this tunnel. And the question is why? And it was early, the tunnel was mature at LUCA. So before LUCA, there was some kind of chemical evolutionary process that form, that drove formation of this tunnel. And in fact, the large subunit is large because it has a tunnel. I mean, you, the tunnel dominates the large subunit. Um, so I just want to show you, I just want to walk you through. This is, the, this is what I called your mother. This is the old, oldest piece of RNA. Uh, this is this dark thing. This, is, this goes back. We don't know what, what kind of world this was, whether it was a world of chemistry or what, but we just know there was this piece of RNA. You add the light blue, and now you have what's called the exit pore. This is the beginning of the tunnel. The next phase in ribosomal evolution is here. This is green, and so you built the tunnel some more. Here's the yellow section. You built the tunnel some more, orange and red. So this is, you know, the, 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 whatever was driving ribosomal evolution, it was really all about the tunnel. The, the building of the tunnel is the only thing that is um, unremitting all the way through ribosomal evolution. You know, you, you acquire the interface, you do this, you do that. All of those things are kind of sporadic. It happens and it's done. But building the tunnel is the only thing that is unceasing all the way through the, the building of the ribosome. In fact, you could say, what is LUCA? LUCA is the place where the tunnel got done. That, that I think to me is the definition of LUCA. Is, um, LUCA is where the tunnel got finished and, and the LUCA was, the, the tunnel was built all the way through the origin of the ribosome. And to understand, I think, what was going on here, you got to think very carefully about the tunnel and what was driving, you know, people are focused on the genetic code and all of this when they think about ribosome. I don't really care. I don't find that very interesting. I want to know why, what drove the evolution of the tunnel. And the reason is I think I know why. So let me just show you, this is, so this is our map of how we think protein evolved. Um, started with, so I'm not gonna explain this graph very well, but anyway, just look at these things. You start with intrinsically disordered, you go to anti-parallel beta hairpins, those collapse into very primitive, like OB fold type things. And then you get this elaboration. And all of this is mapped into the protein, into the ribosome. We know the chronology of the RNA and we can infer the chronology of protein from that. Um, Oh, I'm just for some reason doing this again. Okay, so let me show you that when we look at these beta hairpins, this is how many of them there are buried deep in the old part of the ribosome. Okay, there's not a single alpha helix buried in the ribosome. Okay, not, um, I shouldn't say that because somebody will come up. Let, let me just say there's like almost no alpha helices. I think there's none actually, but there's huge number of beta hairpins. And the ribosome is telling us clearly in this chronology that beta comes before alpha. I mean, that is just mapped into the ribosome. We can see that very clearly. And we see many, many of these. So these beta structures, I just wanna make sure you understand this. These are parts of proteins, but they're not part of globular proteins. Okay, these are all wrapped in RNA, okay? So RNA was the chaperone, that chaperone protein folding and, um, sort of taught protein how to fold is one of the ways you could think about it. The oldest, you know, the, just the formation of a beta hairpin was facilitated by interactions with RNA. And you, the other thing is you don't need a tunnel to make a beta hairpin really um, because beta hairpins just, I mean, beta structures, that's what amyloids are, right? They're just thermodynamically stable. You can form them and they live. Um, but if you want to do this kind of thing, really, this is to me, this is the definition of biology is these elaborate structures. And to do this, you need an exit tunnel because the exit tunnel is a device that prevents beta hairpins from forming. You cannot form beta hairpins in the exit tunnel, but you can form alpha helices. So that exit tunnel is a device 
that allowed nature to produce complex folds. If, if every protein was beta and you don't need an exit tunnel to make beta, then, then we wouldn't have all of this. So really the evolution of the exit tunnel is linked to the ev evolution of complex protein folds, which is really what allows biology to do all of this. This is David Goodsell's image, by the way. I love this image. To me, this is the definition of life, is just assemblies like with complexity almost without cease. And this is what the ribosome, this is, this is everything here is made by the ribosome. Okay, now I wanna talk, go back to build a cell for a minute um, because what the ribosome says to us is that the evolution of protein and RNA was intertwined. You know, that, that RNA taught protein to fold, and I didn't really go into this, but we think protein taught RNA to fold, and that these things co-evolved. And, uh, the, you know, the idea of an RNA world where you had one simple thing, um, just that it doesn't seem consistent with the data. That really uh, macromolecules, and I didn't talk about membranes and things, but we think there was a co-evolution of everything. I mean, that's really sort of our idea of what the ribosome is saying is, is that nothing was separate. And so when we look at a jungle and you look at the complexity and you have all these symbiotic relationships and all this complexity, that's true for molecules in a cell and they cannot, it cannot be separated. You can separate it, right? That's what a cornfield is, right? But in order to grow corn like this, you have to use herbicides and pesticides and fertilizer. And if you leave it alone, it will die, okay? So this thing on the right is what we like, but it's fake, okay? The thing on the left is what biology is. And I think for molecules and for the way cells are organized, you cannot avoid it. You cannot, you know, if you wanna think about building a cell, you cannot run away from complexity and interdependence. That's that's, I guess, how all of this links to build a cell. The idea that you can make independent systems that don't interact and depend on each other, to me, is just a non-biological way of thinking about how to build a cell. That's just my philosophical statement. So, okay. With that, I, I mean, I, this took me like longer than I thought it would. Anyway, uh, I will stop and uh, you can see Anton you know, Petrov and Roger and George Fox, you know, we collaborate very closely with George Fox and a lot of it. There's a lot of people involved in this, but thank you for your time and for listening to me. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, you have several questions in chat. Would you like to go through them? Okay, sure. Um, oh, wait, I have to fix my sound. Okay, I can hear you. Great, and we can hear your echo. Yeah, no, I messed it up, sorry. Okay, the echo should Perfect. go. Great. Yeah, I'll answer questions if anybody has questions. So questions are in chat. Can you see chat? Oh, chat. Um, I guess I have to get out of PowerPoint, sorry. I need to stop screen sharing, don't I? Mm -hmm. I can do this. Okay. I got it, yes, okay. From David, um, could you explain why going past LUCA in sequence is not possible? Um, was the last sequence, all, okay. Well, the, the reason why you, actually, I, you can sometimes, you know, one of the times you can go back beyond, you can use, for example, uh, tRNA synthetases, uh, Kunin and some other people have used synthetases. And the reason is that there's, there's like two classes of synthetases. There's 10 in each class, I think. And so at LUCA, you had 10 synthetases that had a common ancestor and you can walk back and, and look at the evolution of tRNA synthetases uh, before LUCA. In general, you can do that. But let's say with ribosomal proteins, let's, let's say ribosomal protein L2, we do this, we go back to LUCA. I guess you need an out group. You know, if you don't have an out group, You've, you've used all the outgroups, so you can't go back any further. That, that maybe that's one of the ways to think. When you do phylogeny, you need that outgroup. Um, and so with synthetases, because you have 10 uh, synthetases that are homologous um, at LUCA, you can use one and you can walk back. So that's, it's just sort of a practical thing, I guess. And when we first started, when we first submitted our paper, we got reviews that said, 
you are looking beyond Luca. That is physically impossible. You know, don't even don't even try to do this. That was that was how we learned that you cannot go beyond Luca. Okay, I have a question from uh, Lynn. Okay, uh, okay. I don't think that's the question. Hi, Lynn. Okay, question. Your graph of subunit RNA length over time assumed pre-Luca RNA was smaller, but can you rule out that it wasn't bigger? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, we, this is a model we have that that graph I showed you of the, we have two ways, we have several different ways of doing ancestral reconstruction. Um, and they give us the same answer. One of the ways is if, um, it's the way phylogeny works. You have, um, you have two extant species and you say what is common is a characteristic of the ancestor and what is not is not. And so you just keep doing that and going back and back and back. And you can, you know, if you have a lot of sequences and stuff, you can walk back. So these are sort of standard methods of doing uh, phylogenetic reconstruction. Um, that's one of the ways we did it. The other, uh, yeah, basically there's, there's a variety of ways of doing phylogenetic reconstruction and we just use those ways. And so we cannot rule out, in fact, we know sometimes the ribosome shrank. Um, for example, in, in pathogens, it shrank. And so there will be errors. That's, that's I guess you're asking is like, how do I really know about this? Um, how do I know about this model for the evolution of the ribosome? I'm sure there are errors in it at some level, but the, the, the number of instances when the ribosome actually reduced are uh, very few. And we think that in general, it did not happen. Um, one of the, yeah. And uh, another interesting thing, I don't know if you noticed it from that graph, is that the, the large subunit is going crazy. The, the small subunit is basically not doing anything. I mean, the small subunit is pretty much flat. And, and so one of the ways to say that is that our small subunit is much more similar to the bacterial or the archaeal uh, ancestor than our large subunit. And you might say, why is that? And I think the reason is the small subunit never touches protein. Really, the ribosome is all about making protein, teaching protein to fold, doing all these things. And that's really all the large subunit. The small subunit is just a decoding machine and it's just touching RNA. It's RNA touching RNA. Um, this, to me, the small subunit is not so interesting. And I, obviously nature doesn't think the small subunit is interesting because it kind of did it and left it. Most people who study the ribosome study the small subunit, I have to say. Okay, um, if you were designing ribosomal RNA from scratch, would you base it on current RNA? I, I would not redesign it, no. I would take either a, a E. coli, I would start, I think if you're, gonna, if you're gonna use a ribosome, you know, one thing is that the E. coli ribosome is, is very well characterized. It's, um, we know more about it than any ribosome and it's pretty small. You know, you can go into some pathogenic ribosomes and get smaller. I mean, if, if you had a lot of time and resources, it would probably be uh, useful to do that. Um, look at some of the pathogenic ribosomes because some of them are like a little smaller than the common core. Not a lot, you know, you're not gaining that much. So it might not be worth it. Um, one of the things, this is one of the things to think about energy expenditure. RNA is cheap, protein is expensive. In fact, some people think like the reason that the ribosome is predominantly RNA is because if you had to make a protein ribosome and it was that big, it, it, would, there, it would exhaust the resources of the cell, right? So there's, it seems like there's very good energetic reasons for having the ribosome be basically made of RNA. So if you were gonna redesign the ribosome, I don't think it matters much to cut out RNA. If you can get rid of some of the ribosomal proteins and that I think um, is, is could be fruitful truncating them, making them smaller, seeing which ones you can delete, I think would be a useful thing to do. Okay. What would be the point of a, of a small subunit since it can't make proteins? <laughs> oh, that basically you're asking me, what do I think that small subunit was doing before it met the large subunit? You know, I don't know. Um, uh, this is something we, uh, there's a few things we can say. It's number one, the right, large and small subunits are so totally different. It almost, I th they, they seem to have very different sort of evolutionary origins. 
The small subunit is a dendrite and it's very flexible at its core. The large subunit is this huge monolith. And if you think about that tunnel, it, if it's flexible, the tunnel, you can't have a tunnel if the thing is, so that the large subunit is this rigid monolith. It has some flexibility on the outside, but everything about the two subunits is different. So what, and, and people have proposed things about the small subunit, you know, maybe it was a polymerase, maybe it was this or that. I, I don't know what it did. I, I don't know. I wish I did. Um, where do mitochondrials fit into the ribosomes? Yes, um, mitochondrial ribosomes are kind of like pathogenic ribosomes um, in that a lot of the, they, okay, they're, they're, they're the most divergent ribosomes and we don't really use them um, in our analysis, sort of for the same reason we don't use uh, pathogenic ribosomes because they have been, they're the ones that have been remodeled. Um, but if you look at the inner, if you look at a lot of that, like the peptidyl transferase center, I showed you the mitochondrial ribosome from human and it's, it's identical. So the, uh, the core functionality of the ribosome, a mitochondrial ribosome is different, but there's a lot of divergence in mitochondrial and in uh, chloroplast ribosomes. Some of them are bigger. The way to think about the mitochondrion is that the, the mitochondrion and the nucleus are at war and the nucleus is trying to gain control over the mitochondrial ribosome. And in all the ribosomal proteins in the mitochondria pretty much are imported from the nucleus, but the RNA is not. So you have this kind of thing where the, the nucleus is trying to control this RNA yeast in, by sending in proteins. And there's an enormous number of proteins in the mitochondrion and they all come from the nucleus, except for in some very specialized species. Yeah. I'm not sure I did a good job there, but okay. I remember correctly the lining the NNC terminus of the amino isolated codons of a simple RNA oligonucleotide template still allows for the peptide bond formation. Yet your data indicated the templated peptide synthesis is a late stage addition to the core ribosomal sequence. Okay, um, I'm not sure I understand what. Okay. No, I, I, know, I know what you're talking about. The, uh, the Shai Delgado, the, basically where the NNC terminus come from has been stripped away in eukaryotes. So that is actually a place where the ribosome has been remodeled. You know, the, the uh, eukaryotic ribosomes initiate differently. They don't have an anti shine Delgarno and some things like that. And that is thought to be late. So um, that, that has nothing to do with bacterial ribosomes and so that, we don't think that that, um, yeah, I think that answers your question. Um, that is one of the places where the ribosome was remodeled in eukaryotes. Um, basically it had to do with uh, differential initiation in eukaryotes. So it's part of that, some of that ribosomal RNA has been lost there. Okay, what are the ways to build up larger complex structures? This is from Fernando. I should be reading the name, sorry. Fernando, hi Fernando is to cobble them from duplicated and diverged smaller subunits. And these subunits of sign uh, signatures are present in many protein structures. Is there some evidence of structural pseudosymmetry in ribosomes, particularly early phases that provide that strategy? Oh, that is a really good question, Fernando. And yes, and actually uh, a guy named Lupus has also worked on this and uh, he has some papers on this. But what we think is, for example, these beta hairpins were selected for some reason. And then as the ribosome grew, then they were repurposed and sort of collapsed into globular, um, into globular structure. So everything was repurposed over and over again, you know, things that form, yeah. Our idea is really that, you know, nature has no foresight. I mean, folded proteins are great, but in the early days of the ribosome, there was no anticipation of folded proteins that what was driving early ribosomal evolution had nothing to do with folded proteins, but that there was a series of sort of acceptation events where the, pro the product of one event could be used for something else. So initially there had to be some advantage to isolated beta hairpins. And those were kind of optimized and then the sort of collapse of beta hairpins into a beta domain structure was a recycling of those structures. And Andre Lupus has written some papers um, in which he basically says pretty much all of folded protein 
can be seen in ribosomal proteins. And that the really, that nature, I think is sort of the point of this thing is that nature really has not explored any kind of protein folding space after the ribosome. I mean, everything, everything you see, maybe I'm exaggerating what he said, but uh, much of what you see in protein folding can be found in the ribosome. Okay. Uh, Sol Chang, uh, how important in your view is it to study the functions of the extended and core conserved RNA structures of the model? What is the priority? Okay, that's a good question. And uh, yeah, so I think I would translate to that. Is there any utility to studying these like uh, eukaryotic or mammalian expansion segments? And yes, we, in fact, we have a big effort in my lab to do that. And we are, so we are studying the evolution of the ribosome from the beginning to the end. And we are, and we have, uh, I have some really good people working on functions. Actually, these expansion segments are crazy. They're very GC rich. They form quadruplexes, they bind to heme, and we think they are involved in heme biogenesis and installing heme into proteins. So we have, we are working on that. Yeah, we are looking at the ribosome from the beginning to the end. Um, in the lab, and there are other people doing that too. So yes, I would answer that, yes. Okay, from Patrick to everyone, a naive question. There's no such thing. Okay, based on a retrospective view of the ribosomal growth, is it possible to understand the stressors that led to such changes or reconstruct a model for how these changes manifested? Um, I would say yes, partly. You know, one of the things I didn't talk about all, but if you look at the history of the earth, it seems unavoidable that the, that the ribosome originated in a high iron environment. And um, so that's one of the stressors that, because iron is, you know, now the ribosome essentially lives in a magnesium environment, we believe, but an iron environment uh, is stress. And, and, the, and you know, the, the transition from iron to magnesium must have been an acute stress. Um, but it happened all over biology, you know, iron uh, during the great oxidation event, uh, iron was replaced by man manganese and various enzymes and things. So there was a wholesale um, adaptation to oxygen that happened kind of late, but that also, like with all proteins, it must have also happened to the ribosome. That's one of the stresses. The other, but even going back deep, we'd say, what would have driven the initial, why did the ribosome, what was it doing in the beginning? What we really think is that you had non-specific condensations reactions. That basically the earth is turning, water, you know, you have wet dry cycles and you are making and breaking things that are easy to make and break. And some of those are esters and esters can be converted to, ester, uh, to amides and you have these oligomers and you have something related to RNA, something related to protein but they're hydrolyzing, right? Every time it gets wet, everything falls apart, but things that can assemble, this is a really important thing about, I think, chemical evolution, is that things that assemble persist. So if you look at amyloids, or if you look at cellulose, or you look at RNA, like the ribosomal RNA, things that are assembled have a chemical persistence that seems to be built in, and, and to me comes from chemical evolution and drove, so they're, you know, basically there was a selection, things that assembled persisted. And the, the ribosome was really an assembly of these different kinds of polymers probably that preceded RNA and DNA. And probably there was all sorts of them and we're only seeing the survivor. So there was stresses. I mean, there had to be stresses. And that we think water is a stress, right? All this happened in water. And you say, how do you get polymers in water when they're thermodynamically unstable in water? And so we think the wet dry cycle coupled with assembly and protection from assembly drove the ribosome before any catalysis, before anything like that. That's kind of our model. Okay, from Lynn Rothschild. If the size of the ribosome increases with the genome size, maybe it isn't functional, but drift. Have you tried deleting some of the extra parts uh, uh, <laughs> that have evolved over time? Along those lines, are the variable regions more variable due to selection or the reverse? They are not as functionally important they are not as functionally important, so they are free to evolve. Okay, yes, this is, um, uh, okay, this is a really good question too. The ribosome, you know, okay, if you look at eukaryotes, especially mammals and things, you have this kind of incredible gene expansion, and it seems like, and the idea is that this is not adaptive, it's just random stuff. And, um, 
And that clearly applies at some level to the ribosome. In fact, that's what we think is going on with the ribosome. This is a weird thing, you guys, is that if you look at eukaryotic biology, nucleic acids are free. This is, there's a guy, uh, Lynch um, and Kunin and some people who are, are sort of shown this that say that you can add sequences into genomes and it doesn't cost you anything. Proteins are expensive, right? Systems don't just make proteins for nothing, but they do add nucleic acids to genomes for nothing. And, uh, and this is a particularly, it's not true in bacteria, it's not true in under certain selective pressure, but in eukaryotes like us, it's true. So nucleic acids are cheap in genomes and probably nucleic acids are cheap in ribosomes. So that's, yes, the expansion of genomes and the expansion of ribosomes is parallel. But they're actually, Lynn, I have to tell you, there is not a correlation. We looked for a correlation between genome size and ribosomal size, and there is not. Like um, there are systems with much larger genomes than us, but there's nobody, we're king of the ribosome. So um, I'm talking about humans. For, I, as far as we know, we have the largest ribosomes we can find, but we certainly don't have the largest genomes. So there's, it's not a simple relationship. Hopefully that answered your question at some level. Okay. Uh, and now back to Fernando. Oh, is, this is private. Can I? I don't think he, okay. I guess I'll skip that one and for now. Oh, oh, it's to everyone, sorry, okay. Um, what about the RNA structure pseudosymmetry? Did ribosomal RNA divergence occur by duplication events? You know, there are models of that. Um, actually, uh, Ada Yonath has a model of symmetry in the, and um, I mean, and she's our collaborator in everything. And, and basically her model is very similar to ours. It's really not fundamentally different, but we don't invoke that symmetry. And, um, but her, the way she thinks, she sees things coming together is very similar in the early stages to us. So, but, um, I, you know, I mean, clearly things were recycled, obviously, uh, you know, that, that happens in biology, and I'm sure that happened at the chemical evolution, but we haven't built that into our model. I'll, I'll just say that. Um, okay, and then another question from TWS, does the ribosome play a role in optimizing protein sequences? To be more specific, what do you think about the ribosome, about the ribosome built the first functional protein? What do you think about how the ribosome built it? Okay. Yeah, how did the ribosome build the first functional protein and why? I mean, what drove, what was pushing all of this forward? Like the tunnel is growing and growing. I mean, what, what was going on there? Why did the tunnel, what was there have to be, what was happening? What we think is that the evolution of the ribosome was linked to many other things, that nothing was independent. And really what the ribosome was doing was providing a macromolecule of increasing sophistication and meaning ability to fold and ability to do catalysis. And so, you know, you had probably transcription. In fact, that the proteins at the core of the transcriptional machinery are very similar to ribosomal proteins. Um, and so we think they all, so the, the ribosome was building proteins to bind to the ribosome and protect the ribosome, but the ribosome was also building proteins that were used in transcriptional machinery and all sorts of, a, so our idea is that all of this was linked. I mean, it's like a real cell, you know, where you can't touch one thing without touching everything. You know, the, the, the nucleus and the mitochondrion are linked. You can't do something to the nucleus. And so we think on a molecular level, this was happening from the very beginning that it's kind of the anti RNA world model, I guess, you know, the RNA world model is that there was RNA and it was all by itself and it was doing Darwinian stuff. I mean, our idea is no, everything came together and there was this evolutionary linkage, you know, that comes from symbiotic relationships when things depend on each other, their evolution is linked. So that's, that's our model. And it extends to, so you say, what do you gain out of protein? folded proteins, you gain enzymes, right? If you can make a protein that folds, then an enzyme is free. Because if you look at the density of enzymatic activity in folded proteins, it's very high. So even though the ribosome wasn't using proteins for enzymes, it was making folding competent proteins and those could be enzymes and those could 
you know, they could make RNA, they could make all these things. So we think everything was linked. We just, we just cannot escape this idea of linkage that the Amazon jungle with organisms, everything is dependent on everything else. That's the way molecules worked in our model that nothing was ever separate, that, that membranes and DNA and protein and all the ribosome and transcription, it all came together. Nothing, nothing was first. That's, that's, we're a little different than everybody else in the origin of life community because, but that's because that's because we study the ribosome and that's what the ribosome seems to be telling us. Okay, do I have another question? Okay, does the evolution, this is from Javan, does the evolution of the exit tunnel provide any insights into how to engineer the ribosome for improving protein folding? You know, engineer, okay, actually, and this goes back to what Lynn's question too, I, I think, as far as, uh, you know, making changes in the ribosome. In vivo, this is almost impossible. Um, well, no, you could do it at some level, but one of the things is that when you mess with the ribosome, that's death, right? So it's, it's, this, it's a system where you can't, you know, if you really mess with the ribosome, you kill things. And so, and so let's just look at uh, yeast, for example, or human. You know, the number of copies of the ribosomal RNA genes in the human genome is just immense. And so you can't make a mutant. You can't go in, you can't use CRISPR-Cas and go do something because uh, so, you know, in, in yeast, an, I think there's an entire chromosome devoted to ribosomal RNA, you know, it's just the number of copies of, of these genes in the genome are so immense that normal molecular biology doesn't work. And you say, why is that? Well, probably because it's so important, I guess, you know, um, I don't know why. Uh, now, in bacteria, people have made some quasi-orthogonal translation systems so that you can study one while the other works. But you really just can't go in and mess with the translation system because anything you do very fundamental is just going to kill you or kill your E. coli, right? So, so it's, it, it's not normal molecular biology and making knockouts and things like this is just not um, something that you can do with the ribosome. We are trying to set up an orthogonal translation system. We have some ideas on it. Uh, you know, that allows you to do that. There's other people working on this, of course. Okay. Um, could computational simulation of ribosome evolution from its ancestral core using deep learning provide folding? Could that provide a, a huge number of possible solutions? You know, I don't know, actually. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I'd like to know the answer to that. Um, if you use the learning algorithms and applied them to the ribosome, what you would see, I don't know. We just used our brains, which are very limited. So you might see a lot more. Okay, that's from, uh, that's from Fernando again. Okay, another one from Fernando. Uh, given different environments that impose different chemical biophysical changes in LUCA and organisms evolve from it, we're in an evolutionary funnel reflecting earthbound life, but in designing new cells for new environments, why not evolve new ribosomes? Well, fine, <laughs> evolve new ribosomes, but um, I, I would love to evolve a new ribosome. I'm with it. If you want to start on that, it's, you know, it's pretty complicated. Um, and uh, so far we don't really have tools to do that. Um, well, I mean, for, for you know, one of the things to think about this. Okay, in fact, I'll tell you, uh, Andy Ellington did this once a long time ago, where he said, I'm going to change translation. I'm going to make it so that biology uses 5-fluorotryptophan instead of tryptophan. He, this was, okay, number one, tryptophan is thought to be the last amino acid added to the genetic code, so probably the easiest to change. And 5-fluorotryptophan is the, or not 5-fluorotryptophan, -fluoro, uh, fluorotryptophan. I don't remember where, but he said he was going to make the most nominal chemical change to tryptophan that he could. And so he set up a selection. You know, Andy is like really good at doing in the, uh, selection. And he selected these E. coli for a long time. He deprived them of tryptophan. He mutagenized them and fed them fluorotryptophan. He just did this for a long time. And in the end, he had a form of bacteria that could 
extract tryptophan from plastic. I mean, it could get tryptophan from anywhere, but it did not put 5-fluorotryptophan into proteins. So that's, you know, when you talk about evolving a new translation system, that's a kind of what you're up against. It's just, this is, I mean, think about it. It hasn't changed for 4 billion years. There's enormous selective pressure on it that we don't understand. We don't really understand the nature of that selective pressure. What is holding it fixed? We don't know. It seems like it could change. It can change on the outside, but why? Why can't it change on the inside? We don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, all right, I guess that's the end of the questions. I ran way over, I hope, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, you basically gave a second talk answering questions, which I really appreciate. Um, <laughs> Well, that was fun. Those were great questions. I love those questions. I, I, I wanted to ask some, but I think everyone in questions answer, asked what I wanted to ask. So um, that was really great. Um, thank you very much. And we will right. post the recording online. OK. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great uh, yeah. day or evening, everyone. And right. bye. Bye bye. <laughs>